but I couldn't weave them into the main narrative. I just didn't have room. And, and um, but I, I made sure to get them cameos, and this is one of my favorite cameos. This is a fellow by the name of Benjamin Franklin Stringfellow. He was a Confederate spy for General Jeb Stewart. He was five feet four. Excuse me. He was five foot tall. He weighed 94 pounds. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, and he had a waist as wispy as a woman's, according to one of his comrades. Um, and he had a rather unorthodox approach to his spying. Benjamin Franklin Stringfellow would find out where the Union was holding its military balls, and he would dress up in an elaborate gown, and he would call himself Sally Marksin, and he would waltz on over to the Union military ball, and he would sit down and wait demurely to be asked to dance. And all the men loved to dance with Sally Marksin. She was the most beautiful girl in the room. So with every dance partner, he asked what Ulysses S. Grant was up to and what the North was planning, and he made very careful notes about all of it and would report everything he had heard back to Confederate General Jeb Stewart and was considered one of the South's most valuable spies. And I'd like to include him just to show you that the women weren't the only ones cross-dressing during the Civil War. <laughs> the men were in on that action too. Um, so if anybody has any questions or scandalous stories about their ancestors that I can use in my next talk, um, feel free to, to share now, please. Um, <laughs> troops and 
and maybe report it to their local general. I mean, if you can consider them, consider them spies, they like to call themselves spies, but they weren't really spies. Um, then there were people who might um, be couriers and just would be entrusted with delivering dispatches between generals. Uh, Bell Boyd was entrusted with that kind of duty quite often. And then there were people who were, were contracted by their respective governments and actually compensated and given specific missions and taken very seriously. And I would put Rose Greenhow and Elizabeth Van Lu both under those categories. And, and to an ex a, a little bit of lesser extent, Emma Edmonds for the few times that she, she went behind the lines. But um, yeah, but there were different levels. Um, and the, the spy organizations on the northern side only started to coalesce like in 1864 where they had oversight. Before that, it was like every general for himself um, and sort of mayhem. And you, and you can see why the Confederates were able to do so well for so long, I think. But these people were not common, so. uh, They were, some of them were, yeah. Yeah, especially Elizabeth and, and Rose. And Bell, actually. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> that to you know living in Philadelphia where you know people are just thinking about the Eagles um, <laughs> I guess uh, but not really but, but but living down here and just sort of um, what for example one of my husband's colleagues had a, a 10 year old daughter and she had to dress up like somebody for a school project and who would she dress up like but Bell Boy I mean who who knows who Bell Boy is except a little 10 year old living in Atlanta you know just sort of um, and it just was just hearing and a lot of um, meeting a lot of people who had ancestors who fought in the Civil War and who had been interested in that history and knew their regiments and knew the stories. And it made the war personal to me in a way it never had been before. My family came over well after the Civil War. I, my family history is uh, nothing so interesting as, as you know what these people had. But, but I think that there's just such a personal, and, and the Southerners are rightfully very proud of, of their history and their lineage. and. Um, and every time I met somebody who had a personal story about the Civil War, I just got a little bit more interested, a little bit more interested. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, it was one of the great things about living down here and just sort of seeing, seeing that history from an entirely different point of view and, and, um, and, and, and hearing people's personal connections to it. Hi. Well, I mean, it, the South was still starving. I mean, it, they, they could only do so much. It was, you know, a trickle of things that went in. I mean, the blockade was still one of the main reasons the North won the war. Um, just that by the end, I mean, the, the Southern Army was sort of riding, literally barefoot. I mean, fighting battles with no shoes um, because they, they just didn't have anything left. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, of course, by that point, you know, the North was offering incentives for the Southern soldiers to come north and not have any repercussions against them or be charged with treason. Um, you know, just sort of the blockade was that final push. And I think that the, the smuggling, you know, dribs and drabs helped out individuals, but as a large scale effort, did not was not able to really combat the, the Union's might with that with that blockade. Yeah, in terms of Atlantic smuggling? Oh yeah, I mean all the. You know the blockade runners, those great blockade runners that would go uh, back and forth to Europe. Um, uh, you know, was was something that was also uh, I actually write a lot about in the book too. Uh, but but um, you know, still wasn't wasn't anything that was going to win the war or change the tide for the South. You know, Brett Butler was a blockade runner. I should I should mention being the martyr Mitchell now. <laughs> Hi. The book's so well written. Thank you. Well, thank you. No, I, I really appreciate that. The, um, that's like the high, reading like fiction, the highest compliment. I really appreciate that. Um, I I just started, you know, peeking around Civil War stuff, and these four jumped out pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, there were a couple reasons why I decided on them. I wanted two for the North, two for the South. I wanted four people who came at the war um, with different motivations and coming from different backgrounds. I wanted them all to have different reasons for doing what they were going to do. Um, and I wanted their stories to intersect in interesting ways. You know, I wanted one woman's behavior to affect another woman's circumstance. Um, for example, Rose Greenhouse spying uh, was affecting Emma Edmonds, AKA Private Frank Thompson, every step of the way. Rose was spying on the Army of the Potomac, and everything she did was affecting Emma Edmonds. 
Um, another example, these women were always running into the same people. 